Florida 2.0, what is it and why does it matter? Let's back up for a second. So we're all well aware that we live in very interesting times in our country. We see a lot of institutional decay. We see a lot of indecisiveness. Con Congress, congressional decision making has been in deadlock for quite some time. Things are hyperpartisan with Republicans and Democrats constantly at each other's throats trying to get the best media talking points in short clips and snips. Uh, we're now in the throes of the 2024 presidential election uh, with Florida's governor, Ron DeSantis, obviously going to be a big part of that. But then other Florida people like Donald Trump and Mayor Suarez also uh, heavily involved trying to overthrow the Biden regime. But what does that mean for Florida and any kind of Florida initiative that we have in mind when it comes to Web3, blockchain, and really what I would just call simply being innovative. Well, that's the goal of Florida 2.0. Florida 2.0 is an initiative started by my association, the Florida Blockchain Business Association, in order to ensure that Florida is not only the Bitcoin and Web3 capital of the United States and quite possibly the world, but it's also ensuring that we have the infrastructure present so that no matter what happens on a global scale or even to the United States as a whole, Florida is insulated from that. So it's much more than just thinking of how can we be beneficial on the Web3 side. It's also about how do we as Floridians maintain our financial independence, our freedoms, and just a quality of life that continues to be a vibrant place for people to want to live. So let's tackle the Web3 policy side and let me kind of show you how it's much broader than just thinking in the lens of Web3 and crypto policy. So our legislative session starts in January of 2024. But we have legislative committee weeks starting as early as October. And so legislative committee weeks are simply when you start prepping for those 60 days of passing legislation here in the state. So our goal is to have a package of bills that promote our industry ready to go by October. And we've already been in discussions with both the governor's campaign and the governor's office right two separate things but two avenues because at the end of the day no matter what happens with ron DeSantis on the presidential scale he's going to be our governor right at least for the next two years so now we have an avenue to talk to him on two fronts so because we have to do that we actively talk with both his campaign and the gubernatorial staff so by october we have a whole list of packages that we want to promote and i'm going to go through some of those one of the more easy ones to understand would obviously be a right to mine bill, which is highly influential and supported by the Satoshi Action Fund, which is run by Dennis Porter. But what does right to mine really mean? Of course, the bill at face value talks about being anti-discriminatory to Bitcoin miners, right? Uh, we want to ensure that Florida is a great place to mine Bitcoin, even though it's not the most popular state to do so, there are still Bitcoin miners here. But there's kind of a back door into mining. And this is something that I tell people all the time that Web3 policy isn't actually just about Web3, it's actually about how you live your daily life. When the federal government or even state governments go after Bitcoin miners, they're actually going after what you plug into your outlet. It's not actually about the Bitcoin mining itself. It's about controlling what you use your electricity for. You can imagine a scenario where you're given credits on everything that you buy and you're only allowed to buy certain things based on maybe their ESG score. You could buy different fridges, different ovens, different fans, and all of them are going to have different ESG scores based on how electrical or how efficient they are on the electrical grid. When you go after Bitcoin miners, especially from an environmental policy perspective, that's really the end goal, I think, is to control what we plug into our outlets. So a right to mine bill isn't simply just about protecting Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin miners in our Web3 industry here in the state. It's actually about protecting the freedom of Floridians to decide what to plug into their outlets at their house. And that has huge implications. So Web3 policy is not just about our industry. It's about our basic freedoms as a whole. Another bill that we're looking into is, from a marketing perspective, I could call it a Dow bill. 
I almost prefer the term open source software bill because we want to be a state that promotes innovation and innovation is happening in an open source software environment. But our regulations don't necessarily match that. And so you have states like Wyoming and Texas trying to craft what I would call DAO legislation, which um, DAOs, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, for those not familiar with the lingo. Wyoming said, we'll make a DAO LLC. Uh, Texas said, we're just going to kind of take that a step further, not necessarily do an LLC, but kind of touch on blue sky laws and other independent financial factors. We kind of want to do something similar here in Florida, but we want to ensure that if you're an open source protocol, and you're not necessarily a security or financial instrument that you have the ability to innovate here in the state and that the state of Florida will protect you, right? That's a huge attraction if you're a developer or if you're a protocol, which a lot of these DAOs are. Another interesting bill that I think is going to be important given the current financial discourse around the country is the idea of ensuring that digital gold and silver are currencies here in the state or recognized as currencies here in the state legal tender now it's kind of interesting a lot of people assume wait aren't gold and silver already legal tender in my state it depends on the state uh a lot of those legal tender bills were actually repealed at a certain point in time in the united states especially when the dollar simply became king and we went off the gold standard and a lot of them are just simply recognized as commodities. Uh, now, like I said, that varies on state to state. But if we can make sure that a digital gold and silver, <clears throat> a digitized commodity, so to speak, if we can ensure that those are recognized as currencies, what other digital commodities would be labeled as currency, such as maybe Bitcoin? So maybe this is a backdoor to ensure that certain currencies like Bitcoin are able to be recognized as currency. How cool would that be? Further, and here's kind of an interesting thing to note, some of these bills ensure that the gold and silver to be currency does not have to come from the Federal Reserve. How important is that? Some states say digital gold and digital silver or just gold and silver are recognized as currency if it comes from the Federal Reserve. But if our goal is to insulate Florida from the global financial system potentially collapsing, we want to ensure that we are not necessarily tied to that financial system. Another avenue that I think we're going to be taking to ensure that Florida remains a independent state, a financially free state, is to go into banking and ensure that banks are banking innovative businesses, that banks don't have to be pressured by the federal government to debank certain businesses. And of course, the obvious reaction is thinking about Web3 companies, uh, but not just Web3 companies, right? It's not only Web3 companies that are debanked or that are trying to be innovative. But we also want to ensure that banks, especially state charter banks, if they choose to do so, are allowed to custody digital assets. We want to create an economy here in the state of Florida that is truly innovative and free of burdensome regulations that will allow even traditional financial institutions to participate in that innovation. We do not want anybody to be left out. And we do not want a single point of failure in our economic infrastructure here in the state. So Florida 2.0 is an aggressive strategy and it will require years of work. This is an initiative that you could say we've done now since the livelihood of my organization, which is about to be five years old come August. You could say it'll be something that we cannot do alone. We will be forming coalitions with other chambers of commerce uh, here in the state, especially. And we will also be doubling down on our support for those in office who are friendly toward us. DeSantis has been great for our industry. And if you are a person in Web3 who doesn't like DeSantis, that's perfectly OK. And there are other states and other initiatives that you can certainly be a part of. 
in these times that we live in, you're dealt the hand that you're dealt. And so if you really don't like DeSantis, but you're in Web3, you have to separate yourself and realize that in this specific vector, he's very beneficial to you and your business. And if you can't stomach some of the other things that he does, you have to highly consider where your values are and what that might lead you to do, right? Would you rather vote for somebody who is the inverse of DeSantis, but what if they're anti-Web3, which might hurt your business? Those are decisions that I can't make for you. And they're tough and something that in our American system, we're confronted with every day. There is no perfect politician. But we have an opportunity here to not just speak on the state level, but the bigger picture is, is if we can push Florida, Florida 2.0 initiatives in this 2024 Florida legislative session, imagine what that means for the presidential race. Because what's great is our legislative session here in Florida is going to be used is a talking point and platform for DeSantis, who is one of the mainstream Republican contenders. Whether he loses or not, the influence he's going to generate for that conversation on a national scale is going to be incredibly important, which means the stakes are very high for this legislative session. And it also means that the typical political dynamic for passing legislation is very different. We will have a lot of outside influences trying to either help bolster DeSantis or hurt him. The stronger he looks in Florida, the stronger he will look as a president. And of course, the weaker he looks in Florida, the shorter his chances of winning that presidential nomination are. So there's a lot riding on this legislative session, but we as an industry have a very unique opportunity to use a mainstream presidential candidate and Florida's legislative session to create a platform for the rest of the country to follow and to create initiatives that maybe even get other presidential candidates or the current president more friendly toward the industry when they realize how important these issues are for talking points. Our anti-central bank digital currency bill has obviously done that in a variety of ways. And it's created a national conversation to where now it is a mainstream talking point, And I think we'll continue to do so. So hopefully, you guys will participate with us along this Florida 2.0 journey and give us your feedback and give us other recommendations on what we can be doing on the legislative front to ensure that Florida is financially free and independent, regardless of what happens on the global scale.